A lot of fun stuff when we talk about the rock layers and the fossils. And, and really, as you think about this, again, it's about defending the faith to proclaim the gospel. When we talk about Noah's Ark and Flood. And if you're going to, here's the issue. If you can't have death before sin, then how do you explain all the rock layers full of dead things that must have formed after Adam's sin and not before? The answer is the flood. So that historical event is so important to explain the world around us rightly and theologically. So again, we're talking about Noah's Ark and Flood. We'll cover a whole bunch of answers. A couple of them I covered this morning in my relevance talk, but we'll go over those again and do a whole bunch of new stuff as well. But again, the answers are gotten by standing on God's Word. It really is that simple. And of course, you have to read God's Word and know it and interpret it correctly, handle it rightly. But if we stand on God's Word, we've got answers. We can answer all sorts of questions about all sorts of things, including Noah's Ark and Flood. So we're going to dive straight in and just cover a whole bunch of stuff. First couple answers are kind of reviews from this morning, but in case somebody wasn't here, then we'll get to a bunch of new stuff. But people say, okay, if the Bible is true, then how to know get all those animals onto the ark? Atheists ask this like a mic drop, like it's impossible to answer. And I tend to respond with two questions of my own. I say, well, how big was the ark? Most of the time they'll say, I don't know. And then I ask how many animals did Noah take on the ark? Most of the time they will say, I don't know. I just know he couldn't do it. All right? If you answer those two questions, then this answer itself is not that hard. So how big was the ark? Well, again, the ark was a huge boat. Noah's ark did not look like that. Again, banish this fairy tale picture from your mind. Banish it from your kids' books. Get it out of the way because it gives them a false impression. Now, the ark was a real boat. It was really, really big, over 500 feet long. Of course, you have a cubit is what's given in the Bible. That's from your elbow to your fingertip. There are royal cubits that are a bit longer, 18 to 21 inches. We use the royal cubit for the ark. That's the most official one used in big projects back in the day. That's where you get 510 feet. A football field and a half in length. I mean, it's a huge structure, three levels. Dimensions equal to a modern-day cargo ship. Like God knew what he was doing. Imagine that. Which gave a good balance of strength and comfort, stability during the global flood. Capacity of the ark was equal to roughly 500 semi-trailers. So, I mean, it's a big ship. But was it big enough? How many animals did Noah take? Well, the Bible is clear. God brought to Noah only land-dwelling, air-breathing animals. There were no fish on the ark. There was lots of water outside the boat, all right, for those things. And so no sea creatures on the ark. And most likely, we'll get to this more in detail tomorrow night when we talk about dinosaurs. Most likely, God brought to Noah young adults of the animals, especially the bigger ones, like giraffes, elephants, dinosaurs, etc. More details tomorrow night on that, by the way. And then the biggest issue of all is going to be this, that God brought to Noah two of each kind, as we mentioned this morning. Not two of each species, two of each kind. And the word kind, again, in the Bible for the most part, it is equal to about the family level of modern day classification. So, again, as we said this morning, I still stand by this statement, Noah did not take 400 pairs of dogs on the ark. And Noah most likely never saw a chihuahua or a poodle in his life, like I said. And I still contend he was a blessed man. <laughs> I did have someone confront me. They're a poodle lover. Like, wait a minute now. And, uh, it's all preference and bias. All right, not biblical at all. Uh, I told her, I said, it's kind of funny that my wife really wants a golden doodle. All right, that's what she really wants right now. But anyway, <laughs> it's one. All right. Um, but no, just two of the dog kind, two of the elephant kind, two of the cat kind, and so forth. How many were there? How many kinds did Noah need on the ark to account for all the variations we see today and the extinct variations in the fossil record? We did a ton of research on this, and in a worst-case scenario, Noah needed no more than 1,400 total kinds, multiplied by 2, 7, or 14 of the clean. In a worse, worst-case scenario, Noah needed no more than 7,000 individual animals on that massive boat. And guys, that number fits with no problem on such a massive structure. Now, does that number include dinosaurs? I'll give you a hint. The answer is not no, all right? But again, we'll cover dinosaurs tomorrow night in our first session, so come back for that. So the animals fit with no problem. Then when you look at the flood itself, what happened during the flood? And then what would we expect to see if there was a global flood as described in the Bible? And so you go to Genesis 6, verse 13. It tells us this, that God told Noah the purpose of the flood was to destroy the people, but also end the earth. Part of the purpose of the flood was to wreck this world. We tend to skim past that. And it's very interesting. When you look in the Bible, before the flood, people lived on average over 900 years of age. 
what do you do for 900 years? Man, I don't know, right? It's a long time. But they did, and that's consistent throughout uh, biblical history. And by the way, you look at most cultures, they have history of legends when their people used to live to be close to 1,000 years of age in the so-called golden age in many cases. Probably actually a reference back to the real history found in Genesis, by the way. But then after the flood, you'll notice in the Bible, the red line is your flood line, if you can see it here. After the flood, those lifespans drop off really, really quickly to what we normally see today. A really rapid decline in lifespans. Why? Well, it's safe to assume that genetic bottleneck plays a huge role in this rapid reduction of lifespans. Also, also safe to assume that God accomplished his purpose of wrecking this world. Post-flood people and animals lived in a post-flood wrecked world. A broken junkyard compared to what it used to be pre-flood. Broken climate, broken environment. It might, might be what you call real climate change when you think about it. So what happened during the flood to wreck the world in such a catastrophic way? We get some hints from the Bible. Go to Genesis chapter 7, verses 11 and 12. It reads this. On that day, the fountains of the great deep were broken open, and the windows of heaven were opened, and the rain fell 40 days and 40 nights. And if you're anything like me growing up in church, you focus on verse 12 and thought about the rain, but never really thought about what is happening in verse 11. What is that even talking about? When you go to the original language, all, all around the globe, fountains of the great deep, that refers to literally subterranean water, water underneath the crust of the earth. And that's not weird. We still find a whole lot of that today. And then the Hebrew verb there for broken up or to burst forth, that verb there literally means to break through the earth's crust and move the earth's crust catastrophically. And this happened all across the globe all at the same time. Now, if we stop and think about this, what happens today when you move the earth's crust just a little bit? What do you get? Earthquakes, right? Tsunamis, volcanic activity. Maybe you remember this <clears throat> from 2011, 11 years ago now, hard to believe, over in Japan. Remember this massive tsunami that caused, man, just incredible devastation all across Japan. Do you know what happened, tectonically speaking, that caused that tsunami, that caused that much damage? There were two tectonic plates up against each other like this in the shallow waters off the coast of Japan. And here's what happened that caused that tsunami, that caused that much damage. You ready? Watch really closely. Did you see it? That's all that happened. One plate slipped or nudged another plate. And from that nudge, it caused that tsunami that caused that much damage. If that's what happens when you nudge one plate against another plate, what happens when you break them open, move them catastrophically all across the globe all at the same time? You will get earthquakes, tsunamis, volcanic activity on a global catastrophic scale that we can't begin to fathom. It would be enough to destroy the world, which was, again, the point of the flood. So the mechanism for the flood was catastrophic beyond our understanding. But then also how long it lasted is something we tend to skim past as well. You go to Genesis chapter 7, verses 19 through 24. We read that the waters prevailed. They increased. They flooded for 150 days. And then in Genesis 8, they receded for 150 days. So for 300 days, these waters covered the earth, moving back and forth with huge tidal changes, turbidity currents, tsunami activity, uh, moving lots of dirt and minerals and trapping and forming the majority of your fossil record during that time. The entire flood, actually the length of the entire flood from the time Noah got on the ark and then off the ark, was over a year. We tend to miss that if we don't read carefully, don't we? Why so long? We can assume to accomplish God's purposes of destroying mankind and wrecking this world, as God told Noah. And some would say, okay, but uh, if there was a global flood, then where did the water from the flood go? Which is an intriguing question because how much of the earth right now is covered by water? Like 70%, right? And then um, people will say, oh, and that's also another intriguing thing is this, is that right now, if you were to raise up the ocean basins and press down the mountain ranges, right now, the entire earth would be covered by two miles of water. Still plenty of water in just deeper post-flood ocean basins. And then why do we find marine creatures on top of mountains all over the globe? Things like fossilized clams, giant ones, by the way, in the closed position, which means it was rapid burial. But fossilized marine creatures like clams on mountaintops, the Himalayas, the Alps, the Rockies, even on Mount Everest. How do you get fossilized clams on Mount Everest? Last time I checked, clams don't climb that well. 
All right, how do you do how do you do that? Well, the Bible seems to imply how the flood ended in Psalm 104. Towards the end of the flood, the mountains rose up with tectonic activity, and the valleys sank down. As the mountains rose up, they carried with them a newly formed fossil record from that flood event. As the valleys sank down, the waters rose off into the newly uh, formed deeper post-flood ocean basins, leaving huge erosional marks across the continents around the globe. And some would say, okay, well then what about the idea of Pangaea, the one major supercontinent or something like that? Well, the Bible seems to imply that as well. Go to Genesis 1.9. God says that the waters be gathered to one place. If the waters are in one place, well, that implies that the land is in one major place, one original supercontinent, most likely something like Pangaea or Rodinia. People say, okay, but then what happened to that original supercontinent? The answer is the flood. The fountains of the great deep cause continental sprint when they burst forth as opposed to continental drift. And by the way, if you do the math, long, slow, gradual processes do not produce enough energy at one time to move a tectonic plate. You want to move those plates, you need a lot of energy through a catastrophic process like when the fountains of the great deep burst forth. And we seem to see the scars of this event all around the earth. Here's a mid-oceanic ridge. Kind of looks like the seam of a baseball going around the planet. And, of course, there are fault lines around the globe. And when those things move, they cause earthquakes and tsunamis and volcanic activity. But that's just dim leftovers from that major event roughly 4,400 years ago. And to give us maybe a better picture of that event, biblically speaking, I'll show you a video we showed at the Creation Museum called The Flood Initiation. Not your typical Sunday school presentation, right? You might say, I can't show my kids that. It'll scare them half to death, right? But you know, I think it does show us something very important, and that is this, that Noah's flood was a real event, and it was really serious. God was judging man's sin on a global scale. That's another place where those kind of bathtub arcs kind of give you a misconception because everybody looks kind of happy on the ark. They're all glad to be there, but the whole world's being destroyed by a global flood. The ark was a ship of salvation for them, but the rest of the world is being judged. And when you look at the event of the flood, please note, you're seeing God's holy, righteous, perfect justice on display. His wrath being poured out, rightly so. And so we should recognize that. But also don't miss this, you see his salvation on display as well. Because he saved Noah and his family, those eight, so there's salvation there. But also, by saving them, he preserves the line of humanity from which the Messiah comes to provide salvation for our souls. And so his salvation is also equally on display when you think about the flood and its event. And, of course, after the flood, Noah and his family, they got off the ark, and they offered sacrifices. They were glad to be off the ark, I'm sure, for multiple reasons. Uh, I'm going to throw this out there. Uh, I bet it did not smell that good on the ark. Just throwing that out there. And you'll be glad to know at the ark encounter, we did not include those real-life smells, all right? We just left that out. (laughs) Don't worry about that when you come. 
Uh, but they, after they got off the ark, God told Noah and his family to refill the earth, and they got right on that. And Noah's son, Shem, he had a son, and he named his son Arphaxad. And you got to wonder, who does that to their kid? <laughs> right? <laughs> but don't you know that one day little Arphaxad will be with, with Grandpa Noah? He's going to ask Grandpa Noah about the flood, and of course... He's going to tell them about the flood, or he's going to ask Grandpa, where is everybody else? And then Noah's going to tell them about the flood. And they're going to talk about the flood for a very long time. And it's interesting, Shem, our fact set's daddy, he lived, he lived long enough after the flood to talk about that event directly to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, we don't know for sure if they had the conversation, but it makes sense they would at some particular point. They're going to talk about that flood for a very long time. That's a pretty big deal. And then the Tower of Babel, roughly 100 years after the flood, humanity is spread out all over the globe into isolated uh, people groups, isolated geographically, linguistically. Cultures develop over time. They're going to pass down that, those legends uh, over time, get marred over time, but they have a basis in truth. And this is why we see over 300 flood legends, way over 300 flood legends, all around the world that sound a whole lot like Genesis. And cultures literally everywhere, long before missionaries got there from other places, just ingrained in their culture. A few quick examples of this. Over in Hawaii, they had this legend that long after the death of Kunihana, the first man, the world became a wicked and terrible place to live. And there was one good man left. His name was Nu'u. And I bet you know who that is, right? And it says, Nu'u made a great canoe with a house on the canoe. He filled it with animals. The waters destroyed the earth. Only Nu'u, his family, those animals with him, were saved. And again, that sounds a whole lot like Genesis. Or over in China, there is the Haiking classic. It tells the story of Fuhai, the father of their civilization. It says, Fuhai, his wife, three sons, their wives, those eight people survived a great flood. Only they survived. And then they repopulated the world. Which, again, sounds a whole lot like Genesis. And these things are literally everywhere around the globe. And then speaking of ancient cultures and ancient Chinese culture, look at this older Chinese dialect. And what they would do with this particular dialect is they would take multiple symbols, combine those symbols to make other words. And I want you to see the three symbols they combined to make their word boat. It's pretty cool. Vessel, eight, people. Where did that come from? You look at their older words for things like uh, paradise, serpent, uh, mankind. There seem to be tons of references back to the history of Genesis 1 to 11. It's pretty cool. And then after the flood is the perfect time for an ice age. <laughs> it's an old reference, but I still like it, all right? Uh, and there definitely was an ice age, no doubt about that. We see marks of this around the globe where around 30% of the Earth's land surface was covered by snow and ice. But here's the thing. To get an ice age requires a very weird combination of environmental events. To get an ice age, you need very warm oceans that cause much evaporation to get out of moisture into the sky. But then you need cooler continents, cooler land masses, and cooler summers for that moisture to come down and accumulate in the form of snow and ice. So to get an ice age, you need warm oceans, cooler continents. That's a weird combination to get, but that's exactly what you have post-flood. Because of the fountains of the great deep bursting forth, that subterranean water closer to the mantle of the earth will be very warm. And then all the volcanic activity pouring lavas into the oceans, the oceans will be very warm as a result. And then because of the volcanic activity around the globe, you're shooting dust and aerosols into the sky, blocking sunlight, thus cooling your continents. As a result, you get cool continents and warm oceans, exactly what you need for a post-flood ice age. Computer simulations show what conditions you would have post-flood. An ice age will come and go in a few centuries. And this ice age is important for a bunch of reasons. Here's at least one quick one. During this ice age, much of the Earth's uh, water will be trapped in the form of land glaciers. That will lower your ocean levels all around the world. Lower your ocean levels, you reveal land bridges between the continents. So during this time, animals, later on, people can easily migrate all over the world. And then the ice age recedes, glaciers melt down, ocean levels rise back up, land bridges disappear, and certain things get trapped in certain places like kangaroos in Australia. I see all that works together. And then the most obvious effect we expect to see if there was a global flood, if you know Buddy Davis at all, the into dead things, buried in rock layers, laid them in water all over the earth. And as I mentioned at the beginning, this biblical event of the flood explains these rock layers so perfectly and so well 
And he must explain them after the fall of man, not before. That's why it's so pivotal we talk about this in history. So we're going to talk about the rock layers and fossils. And as we dive into these rock layers and fossils, again, remember that key point that they exist in the present and must be interpreted with assumptions about the past. And again, wrong assumptions, wrong conclusion. So we'll look at the rocks first, and then we'll jump into the fossils. So during the flood, we expect rock layers to be sorted into distinct layers based on a process called hydrodynamic sorting of sediment particles. If you want to feel smart, just say that three times, all right? You just feel smarter, all right? All it means is in moving water, different types of dirt will settle into distinct layers based on the size, weight, and circumference of the rock particles you're talking about. So you can do an experiment on your own if you would like. You take a jar of water, put different types of dirt in that jar, things like clay, sand, silt, gravel, shake the jar up and set it down, they will settle into layers for you right in front of your eyes based on this principle. You can do it with air or water. Maybe you've seen one of these before. You take it and you flip it and you get distinct layers immediately. Why? Because the darker particles are heavier than the lighter ones. So they settle into distinct layers based on this principle. Some will say, well, yeah, but I thought, I was told my entire life through the textbooks and what I was learning in school, watching National Geographic, that took millions of years to make a rock layer. Not at all. Water, dirt, minerals, right conditions, you can make rock layers really quickly. We showed these this morning, but I'll show them again. Here's that ship's bell encased by a rock. Here's a clock in a rock, spark plug in a rock. Again, those things definitely aren't millions of years old. Even things like oil and coal do not take a long time to form, just the right conditions. This refinery in Texas, they brag, we make oil in 30 minutes. And indeed, you can. You can make oil in no time flat with heat and pressure on organic material. You can make it very quickly. Same thing with coal. Hear me. Coal does not take a long time to form, just the right conditions. Heat and pressure on organic material, you can make coal in days or weeks. Same thing with your gemstones. You can make legitimate diamonds literally in days, even hours in the right conditions. does not take a long time, just the right conditions. And then we mentioned earlier, Mount St. Helens, which erupted back in 1980, produced rock layers, huge rock layers, and even tiny laminated rock layers. Formed all these rock layers in literally hours. We just watched it happen. It produced canyons like this one, nicknamed the Mini Grand Canyon because it's 140th the size of the Grand Canyon. It has similar features to the Grand Canyon. It's got really steep walls, side barbed canyons, and very little debris at the bottom of the canyon. And it formed this canyon in nine hours. Great observable, testable, repeatable evidence. It doesn't take a long time to make those sort of features. What you need is a catastrophe. And if you want bigger rock layer, layers and bigger canyons, you need a bigger catastrophe like a global flood. And bear in mind, the rock layers we're talking about, they are huge. They're covering typically large portions of continents, if not multiple continents, which just screams a global deposition. To talk about that event and those features, I'll show you a clip from our PhD geologist, Dr. Andrew Snelling, talking about this. Check it out. Evidence number three, rapidly deposited sediment layers right across the continents. We find that everywhere we look. Look at the red wall limestone, full of fossils in the Grand Canyon. Yet the same limestone layer is found in the same position over in Pennsylvania, then over in England, and even in the Himalayas. The chalk beds, the White Cliffs of Dover, we find the same chalk beds in Europe, in the Middle East, over into Kazakhstan, we find the same chalk beds with the same fossils in Texas and the Midwestern United States. We find the same chalk beds in Western Australia. The coal beds of Pennsylvania and West Virginia are also found in, in England and Europe, right across to the Ural Mountains. So think about it. Rock layers that cover multiple continents with similar fossils just screams a global deposition and formation. And then as you look at these rock layers, their features scream a rapid recent formation. They happened not that long ago. For example, you typically find your rock layers like this. This is at the Grand Canyon. Took multiple trips here, going again in about a month to the Grand Canyon. Uh, but you see rock layers, they're stacked one on top of the other, flat like pancakes. There's typically no signs of slow erosion between the rock layers, no signs of soil accumulation, no topography change between the rock layers, just one flat on top of the other and signs of rapid sheet erosion between them, but nothing slow. And this is the problem for the evolutionists because if millions of years were true, this should be the norm. You, see, you should see tons of evidence of erosion over time, valleys forming, topography change, soil accumulation. You don't see that. What do we see? 
one rock layer flat on top of the other. My friend John Albert here pointing out the great unconformity at the Grand Canyon. This is a knife edge contact between two rock layers that extends for miles over multiple continents. And there's literally no signs of soil accumulation, uh, erosion, chemical erosion, nothing. And according to secular thinking, there's a billion years of missing history between these two rock layers. And it didn't rain for a billion years. No soil accumulated in a billion years. It doesn't make good geological sense when you think about it. If you could cut sideways into the Grand Canyon, friends, this is what you would see. One rock layer flat on top of the other, no signs of slow erosion between them, and then signs of massive erosion off the top of those rock layers. Almost as if they were all laid down quickly during a year-long global flood, and then erosion off the top of them as the waters receded into the post-flood deeper ocean basins. And then within these fossilized, uh, in these rock layers, we find cool things like fossilized tracks, things from trilobites to T. rexes, fossilized ripples, Fossilized raindrops. You say, that's cool, but why does that matter? Well, you know when you go to the beach, right, and you walk on the sand, you leave footprints behind, and they turn to stone and stay there for millions of years? <laughs> what happens to your footprints? And they're washed away almost immediately. How in the world do you get these sort of soft sediment formations? How do you get them to become a fossil? About one way to do it. Lay down a bunch of mud full of minerals. Had those impressions made, then shortly after that, very quickly, bring in more mud full of minerals and fill in those impressions to protect them from erosion via water or air. It has to be a rapid laying down of one layer on top of the other. It cannot be slow. If it's slow, they're eroded in no time flat. This is a rapid process. Also, when you look at the fossilized tracks, it's very interesting. This is the norm, by the way. Typically, fossilized tracks go up through the fossil record, and you find the dead critter higher up in the fossil record. Like here at the Grand Canyon, Dr. Snelling pointing out here, these trilobite tracks, they go up through the rock layers for a million years by secular estimation. Then you find the dead trilobite there. He walked for a million years and then he died. <laughs> like going to the mall. <laughs> All right. And of course, that doesn't make good sense, you know, logically, geologically. It makes really good sense biblically, though, because these things were laid down quickly, not slowly. During the flood, these layers are being laid down rapidly. Things like trilobites are trying not to get buried alive. That'd be a bad way to go. So they dig and dig and dig, but eventually they run out of gas and they get stuck and become a fossil. Also, in these rock layers, we find very little evidence of something called bioturbation. It's a big $5 word. All it means is life leaves a mess. And if you have kids, you know this to be true. Amen, parents? Life leaves a mess. <laughs> and um, same thing in, in also as you look at the world. After some event like a flood event, for example, that lays down a bunch of mud layers, those mud layers don't stay pretty very long. Why? Because things start digging through those layers. They're trying to find food or make new homes. Pretty layers don't last very long after a major event. Yet all over the world, we find beautiful rock layers with no signs of bioturbation. It's like life never had a chance to mess them up, like they were laid down too quickly during a year-long global flood. And then also, literally around the globe, we find this feature. We find tightly bent rock layers bent at radical angles, sometimes close to over, or actually over 90 degrees of an angle. Multiple rock layers all bent in the same direction over 90 degrees. You ever try to bend a rock? Rocks don't bend, right? So how do you get these bent rock layers all around the globe? And based on the features of the crystalline structure of the sand particles inside, heat was not involved. We see this literally everywhere. One other way to do it. Lay down all these mud layers full of minerals during the global flood. Towards the end, with tectonic activity, bend those layers in the same direction. Have those layers harden in that newly bent shape. Again, like we see literally all over the globe. My, this is me, actually, over at the Grand Canyon. This is Carbon Canyon, Side Canyon off the Grand Canyon, looking at this feature, this fold in the rock layers. You can zoom in just a little bit. There I am. And you see this bend, and you have this bend with no cracking taking place at the bend of all these multiple rock layers. It's a great confirmation they were all laid down together at around the same time, not over long periods of time. And then you have things like polystrate fossils. Poly means multiple, straight means rock layers. And these are fossils that go through multiple rock layers. And this is a huge problem for the evolutionists. 
like this tree fossil in Tennessee, goes through three different rock layers, supposedly separated by hundreds of thousands of years. But how long does a dead tree stand up in Indiana? Right? Five years, 10, 20, maybe 100, but not hundreds of years or thousands. Yet all over the globe, we have polystrate fossils. A lot of them are trees going through multiple rock layers. My son Ian pointed this one out over in Tennessee. Here's some more. Some in France going through rock layers upside down. They're great confirmation those rock layers weren't laid down slowly, rather rapidly. There in Noah's flood. And then maybe you've gone to a cave, you were told the same spiel by the guide, don't touch the formations, they took millions of years to form, right? You got these stalactites, they hang on tight to the ceiling. The stalagmites are mounds on the ground. If they grow together to form a column, that is scientifically called a column. (laughs) At least it makes sense, right? And it used to be suggested it took around 100,000 years to get one cubic inch of the flowstone formation. So the water comes down with the minerals, the water evaporates and leaves their minerals behind and they accumulate. But simply put, more water, more minerals, you can make these features a lot quicker. A few recent examples of this rapid formation in the right conditions. Look at these stalactites that grew in less than 50 years underneath the Lincoln Memorial. Look at these stalactites and mice that grew at this mine in Australia in a little over 50 years. Notice the miners for scale. Those things are huge. Or over in Wyoming, they were piping up this hot mineral water, and they kept piping it up, and it brought up the minerals. The water evaporates, leaves the minerals behind. If you've ever seen this on a sink before, that's what's happening. Water comes with minerals, and the minerals stay behind and accumulate over time as it evaporates. By the way, my wife makes me tell you, those are not our sinks at our house, all right? <laughs> Just for the record. <laughs> Um, but they kept piping up the hot mineral water. Look what accumulated mineral-wise in just 100 years. That is a lot of lime. That's going to take some lime away, all right? There's another one down the road. We could go on with this, but you get the idea. I love this quote from Dr. Jerry Trout from the book Caving into Reality. What geologists used to believe was fact in terms of dating a cave is now speculation. From 1924 to 1988, There was a visitor sign at Carlsbad, the famous cave system, that said Carlsbad was 260 million years old. Then in 1988, the sign was changed to read it was 7 to 10 million years old. Then for a little while, the sign read it was 2 million years old. And now, the sign is gone. (laughs) And guys, here's the deal. Rock layers exist. Questions are, how did they get there? What do their features confirm? And their features confirm a global rapid deposition of formation, not long, slow, gradual processes. They just scream Noah's flood. And then what about the dead things in those rock layers? What about the fossil record? Well, first understand that the fossil record is a record of death. In a real sense, it's a record of God's judgment frozen in stone to remind us God takes sin really seriously. And it's intriguing, 95% of the fossil record is made up of marine invertebrates. That's water creatures without a backbone. Why is 95% of the fossil record made up of marine creatures? I think because it was formed by a global flood. Makes really good sense when you think about it, right? And then also, bear in mind, to make a fossil typically requires very special, typically rapid conditions. You see, when things die, they don't normally fossilize. And that's actually a good thing. When things die, this is what takes place. Decomposition. Scavengers, oxygen breaks it down. Dead things disappear within weeks. And that's such a blessing from our God in our fallen world because that means roadkill doesn't pile up. And that's good, amen? That would be awful. It's a blessing. So God has given us that kindness in his mercy and grace in our fallen world. The same thing in the water, by the way. When things die in the water, this is not reality. Things don't typically sink to the bottom slowly, covered by dirt, become a fossil. That's just not how it works. When things die in the water, things tend to bloat and float. Scavengers eat them, they decompose, and you get smelly water, but no fossil. An entire well carcass will be gone in 10 years and will not fossilize unless there's a very special kind of mechanism at play, different process. You see, to make a fossil, you got to do something like this. you got to sneak up on your pet fish, Nemo. Right. And he's having a good day in his aquarium. Off to the side of his aquarium, get another bucket, put some dirt in the bucket with minerals, mix it up with a form of liquid, make a form of concrete, and then go back to the aquarium and dump that on Nemo. 
and bury poor Nemo deeply and quickly and protect him from uh, decomposition, oxygen, scavengers, and he might become a fossil. And I think I heard someone, hey, do you need a tissue for Nemo? It's okay. He's all right. All right. <laughs> Somebody said awe back there too. Like, it, like, it's okay. Nemo's not real. Kids don't try this at home. But uh, I'm sorry. I'm going to just can't resist. All right. But here's the point. To make a fossil typically requires a very rapid process. You've got to bury something deeply and quickly for that to happen. So I showed a couple of these this, uh, this morning. We'll do it again now. A few examples of the rapid process. Again, here's a fish fossilizing the act of eating another fish. This one's at the museum. And by the way, we see this sort of thing all the time throughout the fossil record. Things fossilizing the act of eating another fish. This is instantaneous. And again, I do call that the Last Supper in case you weren't here for that one, all right? And then the petrified ham turned to stone in less than 60 years after being buried. There it is. Here's an ichthyosaur fossilized in the act of giving birth. Again, this was instantaneous. Here's a new one for you. Over in Georgia, there was a dog that ran up a tree and got stuck in the tree, and he turned to stone in about 20 years. They found the dog, cut him out, put him on display in a museum, and they named him Stucky. <laughs> it's funny and sad, right? And then recently, scientists made fossils in a laboratory in 24 hours. The fossils they made look pretty much identical to fossils you'll find out in nature. And you know, typically, it's just a rapid process. That's the main point for now. And then the features of these fossils, they scream a rapid recent formation. A few examples of that. We find a lot of what I call fresh fossils. You see, what do you mean by fresh? Well, for example, this shrimp fossil right here, based on the rock layer it was found in, the secular scientist says that shrimp fossil is 300 million years old. But when they cracked it open, it had a fishy smell to it. 300 million years later, right? And that's not that uncommon with some marine fossils, by the way. And by the way, this shrimp fossil, look at the fine detail. It's retained its color, which shouldn't last more than thousands of years after its death. It shouldn't be this way past thousands of years, much less millions. It's very fresh, again, in my own wording there. Or this squid fossil, supposedly 150 million years old, but the ink was still fresh enough to write with from the squid. Or as we mentioned this morning, and more details tomorrow night, but again, we're finding literally all around the globe, we're finding soft tissue from dinosaurs still intact in their bones. The tissue is still springy. You stretch it, it springs back in place with blood vessels and red blood cells often still intact. And by the way, these things have been authenticated so many times now, it's ridiculous because the secularists can't believe it. This should not be there. Because those organic remnants, they really at most, at most should last thousands of years. At most. And that's a stretch. Probably hundreds, but at most thousands. No way millions. Yet they're in front of us all over the place. It's blowing their mind. And so what they're doing now is they're rethinking not the age of the fossil, but they're rethinking how things fossilize. Can't challenge the age. We'll see that more tomorrow night. And then the graveyards in which we find these fossils are absolutely huge. They cover three-fourths of the Earth's land surface. They cover thousands of square miles. And guys, when we say big, here's what we mean. Many of these fossil graveyards, they consist of millions of creatures buried together catastrophically from different ecosystems, different environmental systems, all buried together in contorted death poses. How do you bury millions of things catastrophically all at the same time rapidly? I think you need a global flood. In some cases, these fossil graveyards contain, get this, billions with a B of dead things buried together catastrophically. And in a couple places, it's close to almost a trillion. And there is no mechanism in the present forming the, for, the sort of fossil graveyards that formed in the past. Something different happened in the past. It's called Noah's Flood. Uniformitarianism is not the right answer. God's word is. And then as we talk about the fossil record, got to mention this. Kind of touched on it a bit earlier today. But we don't see this happening today, do we? And praise God that would be weird, okay? We don't see animals transitioning from one kind to a whole different kind. We don't see intermediates, these tweeners, if you will, like something in between a cat and a dog or what you see on the screen. We don't see transitional forms in the present. And again, if an evolutionist were up here with me, they will argue, well, we can't see evolution happening because they'll say evolution happens too slowly so you can't see it happening which is extremely convenient, right? And again, as I said this morning in the very first session, I would still push back and say, but if there was 
evolution happening, there should be some observable transition, at least in features, from a leg into a wing, you know, a gill into a lung or something like that. You don't see that. All we see are fully formed creatures with fully formed parts doing what they're designed to do. Like God made them that way. But if this did happen, and you can't see it now, but it did happen, then the evidence for this mass change over time should be in the fossil record. There should be literally billions, I mean billions of these transitions from single-celled organisms to fish, amphibians, reptiles, mammals, humans. <clears throat> there should be at least billions of these transitions, and they're just not there. And the honest evolutionist knows this. I'll give you one quote this morning. I'll give you another one to kind of drive this home. Charles Darwin understood this problem very well. He wrote in his book, The Origin of Species. If his theory is true, why is not every geological formation, every rock layer, full of these intermediate links? Geology, the rock layers, assuredly do not reveal this. And this is the most obvious and serious objection which can be urged against the theory. So he understands the problem really well. So what's his solution? He says, I believe the explanation lies in the extreme imperfection of the geological record. In other words, we've not dug in the dirt enough. If we keep digging, we'll find all these transitions that confirm my theory. Which, by the way, let me just say, fair enough. That's scientific. That's a prediction. Good on them, all right? So the question then is, how has that prediction fared in the past over 150 years? Well, we are now way past Darwin. We have over 250 million fossils in museums around the world. And David Rump, one of the greatest uh, fossil experts of our time, and definitely not a creationist, he very honestly said this about the state of the fossil record and how it really does not support evolution. That knowledge of the fossil record has been greatly expanded since Darwin's time. Ironically, we have even fewer examples of evolutionary transition than we had in Darwin's time. The evidence was not existent in Darwin's day. Today, we've got less than that. Not a good argument for evolution from the fossil record. And then you can put fossils in one of two major categories, either things that went extinct or things similar to those living today. Some of those are called living fossils. But you just go down the line. If you find a, a fossilized wasp, supposedly 30 million years old, looks like wasps you find flying around today. Find a fossilized coelacanth fish, supposedly 65 million years old, looks like coelacanths you find swimming around today. Still fish, by the way. Find a fossilized jellyfish, supposedly 400 million years old. Looks like jellyfish you'll find today. Same thing with roaches and ferns and sharks and turtles and so forth and so forth and so on. There's really basically no change from past to present. Stasis is the rule of thumb, not change. Although there is one difference of some creatures in the past. For some creatures, their ancient counterparts were bigger than the modern day counterparts. They're getting smaller over time. But that would imply de-evolution, not evolution. So, so it's not talked about much, but interesting phenomenon. It makes sense in the biblical worldview, things wearing down over time. A few examples of this. Here's a fossil of a dragonfly that had a 50-inch wingspan. Don't hit that while you're riding your bike. It'll knock you off your bike, all right? That would be huge. <clears throat> or roaches get big today. We have some of these Madagascar hissing cockroaches at the Creation Museum. They're pretty wild, definitely big. Um, but we have found fossilized roaches over 18 inches long. <laughs> hey, like, you can have the house. <laughs> I'm over, I'm over here. We found fossilized centipedes over 8 feet long. Wouldn't need a shotgun for that one. Fossilized uh, so-called centipedes that so were around 10 feet long. This one's a very recent discovery, the size of a car, they described it. Fossilized rhinoceros over 18 feet tall, kangaroos 10 feet tall, wombats the size of a mini coop, which would be a really big critter. Speaking of big critters, we found fossilized quote-unquote guinea pigs that weighed over 1,500 pounds. Fossilized rats that were over 4 feet tall, 10 feet long, weighing 2,000 pounds. Discovery Channel called them Radzilla, and rightfully so. Fossilized crocodiles, 40 feet long. Fossilized beavers, 6 feet long. Big turtles in South Dakota. And do, I'll do one more for the sake of time. He based the size of a shark based on the size of its teeth. And based on the size of the teeth of Megalodon, an ancient shark, Megalodon's got to be 60 to maybe 80 feet in length. That's me and my family over at a jaw structure over in Australia, actually, with the Megalodon there. 
That's how big that would have been. And the teeth are very similar to that of a modern-day great white shark. So it's possible the megalodon is just the great white's great, great, great granddaddy. And we can be glad those don't appear to be around today because that would be bad, all right? (laughs) And guys, we can literally just keep going and going and going. But here's the point. Real observations, real science, real geology, real paleontology confirms the Bible again and again and again in amazing ways. Your faith is rational, logical, confirmed by science. Stand firm. Don't be afraid of that at all. Don't be bashful. Stand firm. Defend the faith. And some would say, okay, Brian, but you went through that pretty quickly, and you seem to make it so obvious that, you know, this stuff confirms the Bible. But if it is so obvious, then how come so many smart people today miss such clear evidence? Well, number one, first understand that some smart people don't. There are many smart people who believe God's word. And as we mentioned earlier, pretty much all branches of science were started by Bible-believing Christians. Right? So keep that in mind as well. But why do some smart people miss it today? And the answer is really simple, biblically speaking. It's something we said already. Because ultimately, all this stuff, it's not a head issue. It is a heart issue that becomes a worldview as a result And your worldview tells us to interpret what you're looking at to make it fit your preconceived ideas. Wrong assumptions, wrong conclusions. Give you one more example of this and we'll wrap up for tonight. There are canyons on Mars, at least one of which is bigger than the Grand Canyon, which is neat. It really is. And so the question comes, okay, well, how do these canyons on Mars form and how long did it take? Well, according to secular scientists in a secular science journal, They said these canyons on Mars formed in a few weeks. Really? I thought, according to you, it took millions of years. How did these canyons form in a few weeks? A direct quote. A flood of biblical proportions. (laughs) Carved an instant Grand Canyon on Mars. (laughs) Dear friends... They're willing to believe in a flood of biblical proportions on a planet Mars with little or no liquid water. They refuse to believe in a flood of biblical proportions on a planet Earth covered by 70% water presently. How can they be so blind? Short answer, because a PhD, which is not a bad thing, but a PhD doesn't change a person's heart. Not a head issue, it is a heart issue. The Bible warns us of this in multiple ways. One example, 2 Peter 3, verses 3 through 7, we're warned that know this, in the last days, scoffers will come. Ever since Christ ascended and before he returns in these last days, there'll be scoffers. These scoffers will say, all things continue as they have from the beginning of creation. In a nutshell, uniformitarianism. Just long, slow, gradual processes, nothing supernatural. God is disengaged. He's not here anymore, not involved, blah, blah, blah. And it says this in summary. You can read the whole passage later on if you like. But verses 5 through 7, that these scoffers are willingly ignorant. They choose to reject three key biblical truths as they engage the world. What What are those three key things? They are the creation, the flood, and the coming judgment. Why? Because if those things are true, and they are, it means this. God made us. We are accountable to him. He has judged the world in the past with a global flood. He'll judge it again in the future by fire and for eternity. And sinful man doesn't like that idea. So what does he do? Romans chapter 1. Suppress the truth in unrighteousness. As we say, this is not a head issue, it is a heart issue. And by the way, that suppression, the Greek there for the suppressing of truth is an interesting word that's used, actually. It has the idea of literally the truth is trying to bubble up outside. It's like in them, it's trying to get out, and they're pushing it down. It has the idea of you being like in a pool. You ever put a volleyball underneath the pool water, try to hold it down, right? And it's trying to escape, and you kind of have to work to keep it there. That Greek, actually, in the language there, has the same idea. These people are working to keep it there, but they're suppressing the truth. It's an active suppression. Not a head issue, it's a heart issue. And that's why we never stop with the answers. Yes, we give the answers, but we get to the answer, Jesus Christ. Because what they ultimately need is a heart transformation, which happens through God's word, his gospel, and by the power of his spirit. And so we're always getting to the gospel with these answers. Because what the false record really cries out is this. God is holy. He judges sin rightly and for eternity. It reminds us of that fact. It reminds us of this, that during Noah's flood, there was one way to be saved and just one. 
through the door of the ark. That's a picture of Christ. When you come to the ark encounter later on, if you haven't been there already, when you go to the ark, when you're inside the ark, you get to the door of the ark, and there's a cross lighted on the door on the inside. At a night, there's a cross lit up on the door on the outside because that door is a picture of Christ because there's another global judgment coming. And there's only one way to be saved. Jesus said, I am the door. If by me any man enter in, he shall be saved. It's only through Christ. And people today in our culture would say, you know what? But, you know, I'm not that bad. Surely God will let me into heaven. Like, I'm pretty decent, right? But that fails to understand what the Bible clearly says about your sinfulness and God's perfect holiness. You see, dear friends, the Bible says this. If you want to go to heaven based on your own work, here's what you got to do. It's really easy. Be perfect. Obey God's laws perfectly your entire life from womb to tomb. Never disobey, not even once. Perfect obedience is required. Why? Because God is perfect. And he will not be around any sin without his wrath being poured out on that sin. You want to go to heaven, you got to be perfect. But then the news gets worse, not better, at least to begin with, because God's omniscient. He knows your thoughts and your motives. Those got to be perfect too. Every thought must be perfect, never lustful, never coveting, never hateful. Every motive must be God glorified first, people served second, myself always last. That is God, God's unyielding, eternal, perfect standard. And any honest person would say, but Brian, besides Jesus, the God man, nobody could do that. That's the point when the Bible says all have, all fall that's why we all need a Savior. You see, the bad news starts in Genesis. We descend from Adam. More sin is by nature, my choice. That's why the good news is so good. That God has done for us what we can never do for ourselves. Yes, God, he became flesh. He lived the perfect life we can never live. He died on the cross in our place. On the cross, he took the debt we owed. He paid the debt. He took the wrath of God on our behalf. He drank the cup dry, the wrath we deserved. He died. He rose again from the grave, defeating death. If you repent and put your faith in him, you'll be saved. And at that moment, a great exchange takes place. You see, he took the wrath you deserved on your behalf. When we put your faith in him, you get his righteousness accredited to you. So when God sees you, he sees Christ. What a glorious exchange, but it's only through Christ. And that's what all this is pointing to. And that's why we defend the faith, to proclaim that good news in an effective manner to the lost and dying world. We'd love to help get you equipped on this one, of course, the website. Again, I'm skimming the surface on some of these issues about geology and paleontology. But you can go to the website. This is your jam. Check that out. There are books that are just focused on this topic. You can dive into those articles on that. Again, these books, the Answers books, we'll talk about some of these geological issues. If you want to dive into that, same thing with the Answers for Kids. Don't forget the combo sets. If we did sell out of anything, you can back order that, and we'll give you the same conference special, same deal, and we'll just mail it to you for free. And you can do it with my books. I do talk a lot about the rock layers and fossils in the book, Quick Answers, to cover a lot of those questions. Very short, very concise. And then don't forget the social issues. We're not doing this talk this time around, but I'll encourage you. The book, unfortunately, is so relevant in our culture today. <laughs> it's definitely worth going through those answers and having those ready to go. And I'll tell you just a little side note. If you could look inside the cover of the book, you see a picture of my family. Because when I was writing this book, really on the forefront of my thinking uh, were my kids. Because I wanted to have something for them to have and hold and to read because I wanted them to know what they believed and why on these issues. Because if you don't, the attack is so vicious today, how will they stand? And so they were really in my mind in writing that book. So, again, you can back order those. We sold up, but you can definitely get those on back order, same conference special. Don't forget the magazine, all those things. If you've got questions about the resources, feel free to ask me. I'm very familiar with all the stuff. Answers.tv, newsletter, heard all this before, all those sorts of things. And if you've got questions, feel free to come see me. I'd love to chat with you guys, answer those questions to the best of my ability. You can find me on Facebook later on. And again, tomorrow morning, starting at 9 o'clock, we have the kids, kind of kindergarten through fifth grade, dinosaurs for them. And then we have, after that, 1030, we have for the uh, middle schoolers and teens, quick answers, two tough questions. By the way, we do have that DVD on the table. So I answer around 15 to 20 questions in that DVD. It's based on my book, Quick Answers, so it covers some of the same stuff there. You can check it out if you want. But I'll be doing that tomorrow morning for uh, that age bracket here. And then um, you can check that out if you want to there. But again, we love standing on God's word. We love defending the faith. I love equipping the body of Christ. It's my privilege to be here with you. It truly is. I was telling somebody earlier, I, you know, he said, you don't have, really have a job, do you? 
I really don't, right? I love what I do. It's such a blessing. And one of my favorite things about doing this is not just conveying the information, which is wonderful, uh, but also even I think more importantly in a lot of ways is just being with the body of Christ. And I get to see in a very firsthand way how God's working around the world through real people like you and me in amazing ways. And it is wonderful and it is glorious. And so it's my privilege. So if you have questions, please come see me. Guys, I'll close this in a word of prayer. And unless there are any announcements, I think we'll be done for tonight. I'll see you guys back tomorrow. By the way, tomorrow night we start at 6.30. Is that right? Did I get that number right? Make sure before we wrap up. 6.30, dinosaurs. And then after that we'll do one blood, one race, one savior. 6.30 is right. Okay. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for today. God, we thank you uh, for just being able to be together. And what a blessing that is. What a privilege it is that many of our brothers and sisters around the world, they can't gather so openly, openly like we do. May we be thankful for that and may we use it well. May we be equipped and ready to stand on your word. God, may we have a passion for your truth. God, help us to be equipped that we might know you, that our passion will be to know you and to love you and to proclaim you and to love those who are made in your image and to encourage the body of Christ for your glory and for the good of those who are yours and for the good of those who need to be saved. God, help us be ready. Help us to be diligent in equipping our kids. Help us, Lord, to love you with all that we have for your glory. Please give us safe travels as we leave and come back tomorrow. And we love you and we praise you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We hope you received a blessing from today's broadcast. We would love to have you visit with us in person. For more information, please visit our website at gpnd.net or contact us by phone at 317-535-3512. You can watch us live and view past services on our website, Facebook, or YouTube channel. Until next broadcast, may God richly bless you as our prayer.